Okay, we are now recording. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us for today's um, second webinar about school-based health center telehealth services. Today's webinar is on billing and reimbursement, which um, is near and dear to my heart and I know um, probably feels very important to all of you in, um, in sustaining these really essential services. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be here with us today. I know there's probably many pulls on your time, um, both professional and personal at this time. So we realize what a big deal it is for you to spend an hour with us. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that a lot of us have some webinar and um, screen fatigue. So um, we'll talk about housekeeping in a second, but we will be recording these slides and posting them on our website. So if you want to to go outside and walk while you're listening, um, you can definitely come back to the, the visuals again later. In terms of our uh, housekeeping for today, um, the audio dial-in is on the screen, so hopefully anyone who hasn't been able to dial in yet is doing so now. Um, as I just mentioned, we are recording the, the, the audio of this webinar um, as well as the visuals, and both of those will be on our website as well as any other supporting materials or resources um, from today's webinar. Um, we also have a lot of other telehealth webinar, I mean, sorry, telehealth resources on our website um, that anyone can access at any time. Um, our website is schoolhealthcenters.org. That's www.schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, the California School Based Health Alliance, hopefully you're all familiar with us and um, have been on many webinars with us in the past, but in case you have not, we are the statewide nonprofit that's dedicated to supporting school-based health centers and school health services throughout California. Um, we do this in lots of different ways, including advocacy, training, technical assistance, um, and our, our annual conference, which should have been last week. Um, so I know many of you are planning on being there, and uh, we miss seeing you all in person. Um, some good news is that we have definitively uh, landed on a virtual conference for the fall, um, which we're really excited about to bring together all the content experts and um, all the expertise from the field so that we can all learn from one another. Um, so we will be sending out a save the date very soon, but get excited about that. Um, we think it, while we would love to be in person, that having the virtual conference will actually allow more of us to come together um, and provide even more content, so a silver lining to that. Um, and just a quick plug for membership, um, we ask that school health centers and other organizations become members of our agency, um, and we do offer conference registration discounts as well as additional school resources and technical assistance to members. So if you don't know if your school health center or your organization is a member, um, ask, or, um, ask us and we will let you know. Um, so I just want to give a really, really big thank you to our partners, um, the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, the Children's Partnership, and the Los Angeles Trust for Children's Health, um, as well as the sponsor of this webinar series, Molina Healthcare. Um, we know that this is a really challenging time for all of us and a really challenging time for school-based health centers, and one of the biggest needs from our field that we have been hearing is some support on how to shift care effectively to the telehealth model. Um, so as part of hearing that need from the field, we have planned first this four-part webinar series, of which there are two more still to come. Um, the last one was on behavioral health, and that recording is already on our website. Um, and then coming up very soon is um, uh, platforms, that's actually later this week, um, what telehealth platforms are compliant and functional, as well as medical best practices, which is next week. Um, so those are the last two in this series, but then we're also already planning future telehealth webinars, one on, on sort of more compliance and HIPAA, FERPA, confidentiality and consent, as well as youth engagement. Um, and we will continue to add more trainings as well as other tools and technical systems as, um, as we continue to do these trainings and hear from folks what they need. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, have put a lot of telehealth information onto our website, um, as well as other sort of COVID response um, resources. So please do check out our website 
and see what's there. And also please do reach out to us and let us know what it is that you need more of, what kind of support you need from us, and what we can do to connect you um, to what you need so that you can best support the young people that you work with. Um, and then also a really big thank you to our um, partners and to the presenter today. Um, CPCA, the California Primary Care Association, is one of our most trusted allies and the source of many of our questions. Whenever we have sort of FQHC billing and operation questions, we call them and they're so generous with their time and their expertise. Um, so we feel very grateful for their support. Um, and in particular, we're also grateful to Bao today. Um, Bao Zhang is the Assistant Director of Health Center Operations with CPCA. She leads the billing efforts for the organization and provides programmatic and technical support in the areas of Medi-Cal, Medicare, and managed care billing, in addition to telehealth, dental, and emergency preparedness to improve the operational efficiencies of community health centers. Um, that has over 10 years of experience in healthcare operations management, workforce development, and strategic planning. Um, and we know that billing and reimbursement will maybe one of the, you know, sort of less uh, exciting parts of your work is one of the most uh, concretely helpful parts of the work that we can help, the technical assistance that we can help providing you all to, because of course, if you can't bill for those services, then you can't keep the doors of the school-based health center open. And we know that billing is already tricky for school-based health centers, and telehealth billing is, al is already tricky for everyone. And so um, to the sort of double whammy of trying to figure out telehealth billing for school-based health centers is a lot of complicated strings and questions. Um, so um, we feel really grateful to Bao to help us walk through this today. Um, we know that we might not get all of our questions answered today, but we can definitely um, use this as a way to capture more questions and um, to get more answers for you and to put them on our website and come back to you with more questions and answers. Um, you all should have a chat um, feature and as well as a Q&A, so feel free to jump any questions that you have in there. and. Um, and we will try to answer them, or Val will try to answer them both midway through and at the end. And like I said, we will collect them and make sure we get answers to you if there's um, questions that can't be answered today. So again, a really big thank you to Val, and I will pass over the um, presenter uh, slides to you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for the introduction. I could not agree with you more that billing is not the sexiest topic in the healthcare space, um, but you're right that it is um, one of those critical operational areas that really do need to be addressed in order to keep um, the revenue flowing into the health center, in order to keep the health center's doors open to provide care for the community. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we dive into the content, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for being on the call today. Uh, we're all adjusting to this new environment, including dealing with the challenges of transitioning to virtual care to ensure timely access um, to healthcare services for our communities. And clearly there's many moving pieces that need to be figured out in order for us to effectively transition to virtual care. Um, one of them being billing and reimbursement for telehealth services. So today's presentation will focus on billing and reimbursement for telehealth services during the COVID-19 public health emergency, uh, specific to FQHCs at school-based health centers. Um, for our discussion today, I will provide a brief background on FQHCs at school sites and the timeline for obtaining telehealth flexibilities in the state. I will also um, discuss the Medi-Cal documentation and billing requirements for both telehealth and telephone visits um, in addition to frequently asked questions. And then as Amy mentioned, we'll have some time at the end um, to answer any questions that you may have. So as you all may already be familiar with, FQHCs can provide care to patients at school sites, um, either as a licensed clinic, an intermittent clinic that's operating less than 40 hours per week, um, or as a licensed or intermittent mobile unit. And both the location and the service must be included in the FQHC's federal HRSA scope of project. Um, I recognize that there are other types of school-based health centers that are for our discussion today we will be focusing on FQHCs at school sites. Uh, 
Um, just a brief background on um, the, our state trying to obtain telehealth flexibilities. So, um, as all of you know who work in the healthcare space, our existing telehealth policies um, in California have a lot of limitations and restrictions that hinder care um, during the public health emergency. And the California leadership recognized the need to um, really move fast to make policy changes in response to COVID-19. And so on March 16th, uh, three days after the president declared a national public health emergency, DHCS submitted a 1135 waiver to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services requesting greater telehealth flexibilities. Um, for FQHCs in particular, this included waiving certain telehealth limitations and restrictions, uh, such as the four walls, established patient, and face-to-face -face requirements. Um, and while CMS, uh, while we were waiting for CMS approval, DHCS actually released COVID-19 telehealth and telephone guidance um, to Medi-Cal providers, and that came out on March 19th. Um, we do applaud the DHCS leadership um, for allowing us to uh, provide those services um, while we were waiting for CMS approval. Um, and then on March 23rd, um, CMS approved the 1135 waiver for California, but unfortunately did not approve the telehealth section. Um, DHCS then turned around and submitted a state plan amendment to CMS um, requesting those additional um, flexibilities that were in the 1135 waiver. And the good news is that that waiver, I'm, I'm sorry, not the waiver, the SPA was approved on May 13th. So in terms of telehealth flexibilities during COVID-19, um, as I just mentioned, the SPA does allow DHCS to temporarily waive the four walls, established patient, and uh, the face-to-face -face requirements. And what this means for FQHCs is that you can provide telehealth services to both new and established patients from any location, including the provider's home and the patient's home. Um, and additionally, FQHCs can now provide and bill for audio-only telephone visits, which we were not allowed to do um, pre-COVID. So we're going to spend the next few slides discussing um, telehealth services, and then we'll sort of pause and answer any questions that you may have around telehealth, and then we'll move into telephone services. So for telehealth, Medi-Cal defines telehealth as the mode of delivering healthcare services and public health via information and communication technologies to facilitate the diagnosis, consultation, treatment, education, care management, and self-management of a patient's care. Um, what does that mean in terms of covered services? So Medi-Cal covers both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth services. Um, as you'll see at the top of this slide here, Synchronous telehealth services require real-time interactive communication between the patient and the provider, and this does require audiovisual telecommunication technology. Um, and as noted at the bottom of that slide, um, asynchronous telehealth is the transmission of patient information using store and forward technology to a provider that's um, located at an, another site. Um, so, in terms of the covered services, um, again, it covers both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth, and Medi-Cal does allow FQHCs to serve as both the originating and distant site providers and bill their PPS rate for these services. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, Medi-Cal is temporarily allowing FQHCs to provide and bill for telephone visits, uh, which can be billed at either the PPS rate or the fee-for-service rate depending on whether the visit meets the DHCS documentation criteria, uh, which we'll go over in detail in a little bit. For now, let's walk through um, what the requirements are for both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth. So what you see on this grid is um, a, sort of a, a high-level overview of what those requirements look like. In terms of modality for your synchronous telehealth visits, it requires real-time live interaction. And then for your asynchronous telehealth, it does require store and forward technology. 
Um, for eligible providers, it's, the DHCS has not made any exceptions to the list of billable providers, so that remains the same. It's still uh, services have to be rendered by an FQHC um, billable provider. Um, the list of eligible services has also not been expanded. So again, it would still be limited to FQHC covered services. Um, and then for asynchronous telehealth in particular, those are limited to teledentistry, um, teledermatology, and teleophthalmology. Um, there are some changes with eligible patient. Like I mentioned earlier, um, services are now available to both new and established patient. Um, the old policy did limit um, services to just established patients, and so that is temporarily being waived. And then additionally, there are, um, uh, DHCS is also waiving the originating site limitations, and so now the patient can be uh, located in their home um, and be able to access telehealth services um, through an FQHC. So what does documentation look like? The documentation for telehealth is similar to or exactly the same as you would for an in-person visit. You would have to maintain the appropriate documentation to substantiate the uh, CPT and HCPCS codes that you're billing for, um, and, the doc and you have to be able to document uh, for benefits or services that are delivered um, via telehealth. Um, in the same way that you would for an in-person visit. That's both for synchronous and asynchronous telehealth services. Um, and then in terms of patient consent, uh, for both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth, you must inform the patient about the use of telehealth and obtain verbal or written patient consent. And that consent has to be documented in the patient's file. Um, I know that there was an executive order um, suspending or waiving the patient consent requirements. And in our conversations with DHCS, they are encouraging that providers um, to the best of their ability obtain and document patient consent. And then um, additionally for your asynchronous telehealth services, um, for patient consent, you would have to notify the patient of their rights to receive interactive communication with the distant uh, specialist physician, optometrist, or dentist, um, or they can receive an interact, you have to notify them that they can receive an interactive communication um, upon request during the visit or within 30 days. Um, so for reimbursement, both uh, synchronous telehealth and asynchronous telehealth are reimbursed at the PPS rate. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the billing guidance um, how you would bill for that. So for your telehealth services, um, FQHCs would bill using the same process as you would for other billable visits where the, per the patient is in person. So that means using your appropriate all-inclusive billing code sets and the related claims uh, submission information. I have a couple of examples listed here. So that first example there is your medical visit with a patient, um, a, a Medi-Cal fee-for-service patient you would bill with your revenue code 0521 and then HICS picks code T1015. Um, if it is a uh, patient that's enrolled in a Medi-Cal managed care plan, you would bill your RAP using revenue code 0521 with HICS picks code T1015 and modifier SE. Um, and then I do I want to know um, really quickly for the group that FQHCs do not bill with a place of service code 02 or the modifier 95. Um, and that guidance actually may differ a little bit from some of your managed care plans which are requiring you to use those codes. Um, but when you're billing claims directly to Medi-Cal, um, you should not be using a place of service code 02 or the modifier um, 95. Um, and then also of note that this guidance that I just discussed only applies to Medi-Cal claims. Um, for any claims that are going out to your managed care plans, please check with your plans for their specific billing requirements because the requirements tend to differ across plans. And then what I have listed here um, on this slide are billing codes for your medical and behavioral health visits for FQHCs. Um, as noted, you would bill for telehealth visits using the same process as you would for an in-person visit. Um, and I also have linked here at the bottom of the slide um, the FQHC RHC billing codes. 
um, within the Medi-Cal Provider Manual. And so if you want to take a look at that comprehensive list of billing codes for FQHCs, um, you'll be able to find it on that link there. So just as a reminder, uh, services provided through both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth visits are subject to the same program uh, restrictions, limitations, and coverage that exist when the service is provided in person. So um, your medically necessary services still have to be provided by a FQHC billable provider to an eligible Medi-Cal patient. Uh, the services have to be a covered FQHC service. The same day limitations still apply, um, and then out of network policy still applies. I know that was a lot of information that I just threw at you, uh, but I hope that it was helpful in clarifying the requirements. Um, do keep in mind that there are five factors that determine how you would bill for a telehealth visit. Um, so let's um, kind of walk through what those are. One, um, that's where the patient is physically located. And as I mentioned, during COVID-19, uh, both the patient and the provider can be located anywhere. And then two, the characteristics of the distance site provider, whether it's a fee-for-service provider or an FQHC. Um, three, it's the payment arrangement that you have with a distance site provider. Um, and then four, if there is a medical reason for the FQHC provider to be with a patient, um, to be present with the patient at the originating site. And just keep in mind that during COVID-19, the provider um, does not have to be phys uh, physically present um, in the patient's home with them. And then uh, five, if the patient is, is new or established, and again, this is being temporarily waived during um, the public health emergency. So let's take a look at two billing scenarios. Um, this first one here is a patient that is enrolled in straight Medi-Cal who is located at home, and the FQHC is serving as um, the distance site provider. So. Um, the FQHC is providing a covered service and can bill the PPS for the visit. Um, and as I mentioned earlier and is noted in this blue box here, that during COVID-19, DHCS is waiving the established patient of four walls requirements, um, allowing telehealth services to be provided to both new and established patients from any location. And then the second example here, uh, the patient is enrolled in a Medi-Cal managed care plan. And similar to the last example, the patient is located at home and the FQHC is serving as the distance site. Uh, so in this case, the FQHC would build a managed care plan followed by a wrapped claim uh, to Medi-Cal. And if you're curious about what this would look like on a claim form, here are two examples. That top example there is a telehealth visit with a patient that's enrolled in Medi-Cal fee-for-service. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you would bill with your revenue code 0521. Um, and your HICS six code T1015, and then you would add information line items um, corresponding to the services that were provided during the visit. That second example there um, is, for a tele is for a patient that is enrolled in a Medi-Cal uh, managed care plan. So you'll see that it's using the uh, HIPAA compliant billing code set for the RAP claim. Um, and then I will also note that what I shared in terms of the billing codes is not the comprehensive list of billing codes um, and certainly, you know, not a comprehensive uh, description of all of the various scenarios um, for telehealth. If you want to get a better sense of um, whether or not your particular scenario at your health center is um, eligible for PPS reimbursement, uh, please take a look at the FQHC REC section of the Medi-Cal Provider Manual, which includes the telehealth policy and the various um, billing and reimbursement um, uh, scenarios. Um, so I just took a screenshot of a small section of that policy, um, and you'll see here that it, it kind of provides detailed information. I, I think detailed enough for you to get a sense of whether or not you can bill for those services. So I would highly encourage you to take a look at that, and a link to that is provided at the top of this um, slide here. Um, so I will pause there to take any questions about telehealth um, before moving to telephone visits because the requirements, um, both documentation-wise and billing-wise, um, look a little bit different for telephone. So 
Um, Amy, I'm happy to take any questions um, if there's anything in the chat box or if folks um, have their hands raised. I have not gotten any questions yet. Okay. Oh, there's a question. Um, can you type the website into the chat, which I can do that. Okay, great. Wonderful. All right, so I hope that means that I'm doing a good job in uh, <laughs> relaying this information to you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to telephone visits if there are no questions and then certainly um, if anything comes up while I'm presenting, feel free to chat it into the chat box or the Q&A um, and I can get to that at the end. All right, so let's talk about telephone visits. Um, as I mentioned earlier, DHCS is allowing FQHCs to provide and bill for audio only telephone visits during the public health emergency. Um, for Medi-Cal, it defines telephonic visits as the delivery of healthcare services via an audio only telephone with a patient who cannot or should not be physically present. A telephonic visit is a reimbursable PPS, um, it, sorry, is reimbursable at the PPS rate for FQHC billable providers if provided and billed consistently with an in-person visit. Um, so let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, in terms of modality for your telephone visit, it only requires that you um, utilize an, um, a technology that allows for audio communication. Um, and then again, no changes to the list of eligible for providers or eligible um, services. Um, and then once again, the eligible patient um, has been expanded to now include both new and established patients. Um, and then also the restrictions on the patient's location is being temporarily waived. There are very specific documentation criteria that FQHCs have to meet in order to bill PPS for the telephone visit. Otherwise, you would have to bill fee for service. So what does that documentation criteria um, look like? One, the provider must document circumstances involved that prevent the visit from being conducted face-to-face. -face. Um, one example of that is the local or state guidelines that direct the patient to remain at home during this time. Um, two, the provider must document the telephone visit to take place of a face-to-face -face visit. Um, three, the provider must document that the services are medically necessary and clinically appropriate to be de delivered via um, a telephone visit. Uh, four, the provider must ensure uh, sufficient documentation in the medical records that satisfy the requirements for the specific CPT and HCPCS codes that you're billing for. Um, and then five, the provider must meet all other procedure and technical components similar to an in-person visit. Um, what this would include is like your patient history, um, services that were provided, assessment, examination notes, diagnosis, treatment, um, that sort of thing. So let's talk about the billing requirements. Um, Keep in mind that you have to meet the documentation requirements in order to bill PPS. So in the instance that the visit meets all of the documentation criteria that I just discussed, you would bill um, according to like what's on the slide here. So let's start with your Medi-Cal fee-for-service patients. Uh, for those patients, you would bill using the apl applicable revenue code uh, corresponding to the type of service along with HCPCS code T1015 and then also include the appropriate corresponding CPT codes. Um, DHCS wants FQHCs to use um, the E&M codes that um, correspond to like new or established patients um, and that would go in the informational line item and that it would it would just be for informational purposes so that DHCS can track those visits. Um, it, it's not separately billable. And then for your Medi-Cal managed care patients, you would bill your managed care plan, uh, or sorry, for your, you would bill using the revenue code uh, 0521 with the procedure code T1015 and the modifier SE. 
Um, and as BHCS has always done, they will ensure that FQHCs are made whole um, with the appropriate rep payments. Now, if the telephone visit does not meet the documentation criteria, um, it will not be reimbursed at the PPS rate and the billing does look different. So for these particular visits, you would bill using HICS-PICS code G0071. Um, that would go on your payable line and then you would not include any corresponding CPT codes um, as informational items and this is paid at a fee-for-service rate of $13.69. Um, I will quickly note here that um, we have been hearing about denials um, for claims that were billed with this particular code. Um, I did have a conversation with folks over at the state on Friday and learned that the Medi-Cal system is actually not currently set up to process and pay these claims. And so providers are um, seeing erroneous denials and the state does plan to make those systems changes soon. Um, in the meantime, they are encouraging providers to continue to submit these claims even if they result in denials because the state does plan to implement an EPC um, to automatically reprocess all of those claims. Um, and then for your Medi-Cal managed care patients, uh, do keep in mind that um, billing for the billing guidance that I just discussed in terms of using G0071 um, does not apply to your, your Medi-Cal managed care claim. Uh, please do check with your managed care plan for their particular billing um, instructions. And then also of note, um, the telephone visits that do not meet the documentation criteria are not eligible for um, a wrap payment. Um, some additional billing requirements to keep in mind, um, as I mentioned earlier, FQHC should not use the place of service code 02 or the 95 modifier when you're billing um, at a Cal for telephonic visits. Um, also, if your managed care plan is requiring that you, um, you bill with place of service code 02 and the 95 modifier, you would have to follow their, their guidance. And that may mean that in terms of um, getting your claims out that you may need to implement a mapping um, that allows the place of service code and the modifier for your managed care claims and then not for your wrap. I'm going to transition a little bit. Um, I will um, share a couple of questions and responses that uh, we've been receiving from community health centers uh, since, since COVID-19, since the start of COVID-19. Um, these questions were actually sent over to DHCS. And if you've seen the latest DHCS guidance, I think the majority of these are also included in their FAQ. Um, it, their guidance has a lot of really useful information, and so if you have not had an opportunity to review that guidance, I would highly encourage you uh, to do so. We do have a link to that guidance um, on one of the slides uh, later on, and I, I'll point that out once we get there. Um, so one of the questions that we've received is, um, can FQHCs and RHCs bill mental health and medical visits via telephone on the same day? Um, and the answer is no, because the same day restrictions still apply. FQHCs cannot bill for a mental um, health or behavioral health visit on the same day as a medical visit. And then two, are, require, are registered nurses able to provide Medi-Cal covered benefits or services via um, virtual telephonic communication um, and bill the Medi-Cal fee for service rate? And the answer is no. Uh, once again, DHCS has not made um, any exceptions to the list of FQHC billable providers. Um, so the services will still have to be rendered by an FQHC billable provider. Um, additionally, um, other questions are, can providers utilize a hybrid model to de deliver well child care visits? For example, combining a virtual visit where the provider will review all the questionnaires, conduct counseling, review, anticipatory guidance, and then conduct a brief in-person visit for vitals, weight, height, vision, um, hearing, point of uh, care test, vaccines, um, basic physical exam, et cetera. Um, what DHCS has said is that to the extent that certain components of the visit can be done virtually, 
Um, FQHCs can provide those services. Um, and then if there is an in-person component, um, it would be considered a continuation of that first visit. So what that means is that you can only bill for one visit. You would not be able to bill for the telehealth visit or the telephone visit, um, and then turn around and bill for your in-person visit that occurs either on the same day or on a separate day because it's all, all of the services that were provided should have been provided as part of like one visit. Um, and then one of the other questions that we've received is what can or may be billable for school-based um, LEA Medi-Cal programs? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with um, that kind of billing. And so I did take a look at the DHCS website and see that um, they have a pretty extensive list of resources um, for those provider types. And so I would encourage you to take a look at their website for those resources. I've included a link here, um, which is hyperlinked in blue. So feel free to take a look at that resource. Um, here is a listing of FQHC, REC, billable um, billing and reimbursement resources. I linked them on some of the slides kind of throughout the presentation at the bottom. I wanted to make sure that I fully capture all the resources on this slide here. So for any of the information that I presented today, um, it, it did come from, you know, a DHCS um, resource. And so I, I would highly encourage you to please take a look at these resources if you have not had a chance to do so. I will note that that first link there, the DHCS telehealth telephonic visit guidance, um, really important. So please take a look at that. It has more details for billing and reimbursement. Um, documentation, consent, uh, so please take a look at that resource. Um, if you want to reference what the current telehealth policy looks like for FQHCs and RECs, um, that is available on the Medi-Cal website as well, and it's that second link there. And that actually wraps up um, the formal part of my presentation. Um, so I will go ahead and pause here and I'm happy to take any questions. Amy, are you seeing anything on your end? Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought I had unmuted, but I hadn't. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bao. Um, yes, I'll just weigh in really quickly. Um, from Lisa Eisenberg, our policy director, she has informed us that the LEA Billing Option Program, which is a school-based Medi-Cal, did recently release guidance allowing telehealth services for that program. So um, if you are a school-based Medi-Cal provider, definitely follow those that link to get those resources um, to learn more about school-based Medi-Cal billing. Um, so I, did, we did get a couple of other questions, um, so just to consolidate them a little bit. Um, the one person asked, the documentation requirements for the PPS billable telephone visits seem like they're the same or really close to the requirements for the audiovisual documentation. Um, are we missing something or are some of the requirements different? I mean, it is, it is similar. Um, it's similar, I think. Uh, typically for telehealth visits, you don't have to document uh, why the patient can't come in for a face-to-face -face visit. Um, but for your telephone visits, you would have to document that. And again, it could be something as simple as um, there is a, a shelter-in-place order, um, and so the patient's are recommended to stay at home. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. And then can you talk for just a minute about FPAC? So we had a question about, um, in general, is the guidance different? And um, can FPAC telehealth visits be phone visits to get full reimbursement, or do they need to be video visits? Yeah, that is a really great question. I will tell you that there's some confusion with FPAC. Um, and I did not include FPAC in this particular presentation because for FQHCs, it is um, considered like it's, it's uh, separate from PPS. It's actually paid fee-for-service and FQHCs have to separately enroll in that program. 
Um, what I can share with you is that um, Family Pack does cover telephone services, but my understanding is, is that it's not covered in the same way um, that I just talked about for FQHCs with like your PPS claims. Uh, my understanding that is that it covers virtual telecommunication, um, and that's with like the fee for service codes. And I don't recall what those are exactly, but that's like your brief check in, basically for triaging to determine if the patient needs to come in for a visit. And I'm not quite sure actually on the telehealth end um, what services are covered for FPAC and how you would go for that or what the reimbursement rate would look like. Um, I do think that we need to get clarification on that. And so um, CPCA will be reaching out to folks over at the state to get some clarity. And once we have some information to share, um, we will certainly push it out to our membership. I'm happy to share it with um, Amy once we do have that guidance. And if, Amy, if you want to share it out with your, your membership, um, I would encourage you to do so. That would be great. We will definitely send that out and include in the resources from this webinar. Um, that was incredibly informative. I just want to give a last call if people have any other direct questions. Um, again, the um, CSHA website, schoolhealthcenters.org, has a lot of COVID-specific and telehealth-specific resources, and then CPCA, of course, has a lot of billing and reimbursement specifically for FQHCs, um, including those that are providing school-based health services. So um, definitely go back to those websites. Um, and we'll make sure to send out all the referenced websites that we discussed today as part of the notes and the resources from today. I think that's it from questions. So I'll just say thank you again so much to Bao and um, thank you to all of us for joining us today. And definitely reach back out to us um, with specific telehealth and billing reimbursement questions, as well as any other needs that you have at this time, um, any other topics that you'd like to see discussed as part of this telehealth webinar series or in general. And take really good care of yourself.